Three, two. Good afternoon. I now call to order the meeting of the Equity Committee for Thursday, January 27th, 2022. In accordance with the Board of Education's rec excuse me, Board of Education's amended resolution approved at the October 13th, 2020 board meeting, in the event of a medical or health emergency related to COVID-19, the board chair in consultation with the vice chair and the superintendent may declare that a board meeting or a board committee meeting be held remotely in its entirety without the physical presence of board members or in a hybrid manner with only some individual board members participating remotely subject to the establishment of a mechanism that would allow each board member the opportunity to fully participate in the meeting despite not being physically present and that would allow the public to also remotely attend those portions of the meeting that are open pursuant to the Maryland Open Meetings Act by being able to listen and or view those portions of the meeting. As a result, today's equity committee meeting is being held virtually and broadcasted through Microsoft Teams Live on the BCPS website. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. Ms. Ms. Fass, please call the roll call of board members to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Ms. Scott? Present. Dr. Hager? Ms. Pen Jones? Sorry. Present. Ms. Pastor? Present. Ms. Rowe? And Mr. Thomas? Okay. Are there any additional board members who are joining us? Okay, doesn't sound like there are. Thank you. Um, Ms. Fass, please call the role of staff members on the committee participating in today's meeting. Mr. Handy? Present. Dr. Yarborough? Dr. Elmendorf? Present. And Ms. Forbes? Present. That's it. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, so it looks like the first item on our agenda is virtual learning program overview. And for that presentation, I call on Dr. Douglas Elmendorf and Mrs. Julie and Miss Julie Forbes. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Happy Thursday. I know Dr. McComas wishes she could be here and sends her uh, best wishes. Um, if you could hit the next slide there, please. Are you driving, Mr. Corns? All right, uh, good afternoon. We have been working really closely with Mr. Handy and his staff as we use an equity lens to both develop and improve the virtual learning program or the VLP. Uh, realizing the program is new and evolving, we hope this overview of the program provides some valuable information for the members of this committee. Next slide, please. This presentation is particularly aligned with focus area one of the strategic plan. The goal of focus area one of the BCPS strategic plan, learning, accountability, and results is increased achievement for all students while preparing a variety of pathways to prepare students for career and college. This area of the compass recognizes that excellence in student achievement is grounded in effective and responsive teaching of a rigorous inclusive curriculum aligned to standards. Next slide, please. The VLP staff is composed of some very talented professionals, including the director, Ms. Julie Forbes, who is presenting with me this afternoon. Julie came to us from Queen Anne's County, where she worked in the area of accountability, assessment, and data management. Prior to that, Ms. Forbes enjoyed important leadership roles in a California school system. As you can see on this slide, each um, level of the VLP has both a coordinator and a supervisor to fill out the administrative team. Next slide, please. Creation of the VLP in its current format was a direct response to the pandemic. Surveys of the BCPS community in the spring of 2021 indicated that some families desired a virtual option. As such, a plan was developed and submitted to MSDE, which approved the plan shortly thereafter. 
The development of the VLP was grounded in existing practices, including the use of the BCPS curriculum. In its current format, the VLP is a co-enrolled program, which means that all of the students participating in VLP are co-enrolled in their zoned school. This partnership allows for students to participate in sports and extracurricular activities, and also helps to facilitate logistical needs like test administration and materials distribution. There were ultimately three enrollment opportunities for the virtual learning program. Feedback from the BCPS community initiated an extension of the original deadline from June 1st to July 1st. Then in response to the Delta variant, we implemented a process in which families could make a request for co-enrollment. Much like the medical exception that is housed in the special permission transfer process of policy and rule 5140, families could submit medical documentation, which was considered along with the Office of Health Services in making a decision on co-enrollment. That opportunity concluded on September 30th. Ms. Forbes will now share some specific information related to enrollment. Next slide, please. Great, thank you. This slide represents the total VLP enrollment as well as a breakdown of enrollment by zone. It is worth noting that 551 of the almost 3,000 students enrolled in the VLP after the first day of school. Next slide, please. This slide represents the overall VLP enrollment and BCPS enrollment. As referenced in the previous slide, the VLP data represents approximately 3,000 students from throughout BCPS who are enrolled in the virtual learning program. The BCPS enrollment data referenced in this slide was sourced from the Maryland report card. There are some similarities and differences when comparing VLP enrollment to overall BCPS enrollment. For example, the percentage of Black and African American students who are enrolled in VLP is nearly 58%, while enrollment in BCPS is approximately 39%. The enrollment of Hispanic and Latino students in VLP is just over 8% compared to 12% of the VLP of the BCPS enrollment, excuse me. The percentage of white students in VLP is slightly above 20% compared to 36% of enrollment in BCPS. The percentage of students who are English learners is just above 4% in the VLP, lower than the district enrollment of 8%. In addition, the percentage of students who qualify for special education services is nearly 11%, slightly lower than the district enrollment of approximately 13%. Dr. Elmendorf will now talk about attendance in the VLP. Next slide, please. This is a slide that was presented at the December Board of Education meeting. In the first marking period, the VLP middle school students demonstrated the highest attendance rate at above 95%, followed by the high school at 92% and elementary at 91%. Understanding that attendance in a virtual setting looks different than that of a brick and mortar environment, BLP staff regularly communicated with families about the importance of attendance from the beginning of the school year. Attendance continues to be analyzed at the student level and personalized outreach efforts take place through counselors, teachers, and administrators. Ms. Forbes will share some more specific information related to attendance in the VLP. Next slide, please. Okay, this slide shows a breakdown of attendance in the first quarter by student group. Attendance in the virtual learning program is measured in each class period, and students log into their Google Meet session to be indicated as present. Students are expected to log into each period and each class on a daily basis in order to be marked present. Next slide, please. The course performance findings for the VLP shared at the recent Board of Education meeting reflect some of the challenges of transitioning to a brand new learning environment, including significant enrollment fluctuation, staffing vacancies, and adjusting to the unique characteristics and expectations of a comprehensive online learning program. As these transitional components have settled in, improving course performance, this is, is the uh, primary focus of Ms. Forbes and her team. Ms. Forbes will now share more about the responses and supports that are currently in place to address course performance and other components of the VLP. Next slide, please. VLP leadership is focused on continuing to support attendance rates, social emotional learning, and students course performing performance by incorporating the following strategies. VLP staff continues to differentiate and strengthen communication and partnerships with homeschools and families. There were no suspensions in the first quarter for the VLP. Understanding that negative behaviors are minimized when students are highly engaged in learning, VLP leadership is building the capacity of the students and adults to understand effective engagement in a 
virtual environment. Professional learning teams are analyzing grade data and determining root causes and setting ambitious goals to increase the percentage of passing grades with regular progress monitoring. Collaboratively designed action, pl action plans are being developed at each level of the VLP. And the VLP administrative team is working with stakeholders to customize professional development around teaching in the virtual environment with a focus on student engagement and connection. Some other strategies include tutoring, small group instruction, professional learning for teachers, and increasing family engagement. Dr. Elmendorf will now share VLP parent perception data. Next slide, please. In October, we surveyed the current VLP families to get a better understanding of why they chose VLP and how we could better respond to the needs of our families going forward. As you can see, of the families that responded to the survey, about three quarters of the families enrolled in VLP reported having only one child enrolled in the program. Next slide, please. We asked parents why they chose to enroll in the virtual learning program. Families were given an opportunity to choose more than one reason. As was indicated earlier, the VLP was originally initiated in response to the pandemic during a time in which a vaccine was not available for our youngest students. As such, enrolling in the VLP because someone in the household other than the student had a medical condition was a popular response. The most popular response for enrolling, however, was because families felt that their child learns well in an online learning environment. Next slide, please. The responses to these questions are very really important as we can contemplate the future of the virtual learning program, which I will talk about on the next slide. We asked our families if they thought they would want to continue with a virtual option once the public health concerns caused by the pandemic have been alleviated. 90% of the families surveyed responded with yes or maybe when asked this question. Next slide, please. While this presentation is primarily focused on the current virtual learning program, we want to share a little bit about what we have been doing in an effort to determine the best path forward for the virtual learning program. In addition to a literature review, we conducted surveys and focus groups with various Team BCPS stakeholders. We also met with 10 other Maryland school systems and a few offices within MSDE, as well as some out-of-state school systems. Currently, we are working with a thought partner group of um, staff from all components of the system to determine what recommendations will be made for next year and beyond. Next slide, please. Thank you for your time. Oh, great, thank you. Um, and board members, um, Oh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Mr. Handy, um, was that the complete uh, presentation? Yes, yes. Okay, sorry, I didn't want to <laughs> come in there um, if that wasn't it. So thank you for that, that was very informative. Um, and if any questions, please board members, put your um, questions in the chat and I'll start off. Um, with the virtual learning, I know you spoke about it, um, but I wanted to know a little bit more. This is Ms. Scott speaking. Um, what were some of the main reasons? Um, could you expand on those as far as why students were choosing virtual learning as opposed to coming in in person? What were some of the main reasons say, that you were hearing? That's my first question. Sure, if um, whoever's doing the slides could go back to, um, I think it's slide 13-ish. There we go. The next one, sorry. Um, so many of these co-enrollments were done back in June um, or in the summer. Um, 551 of them, as uh, Ms. Forbes mentioned, were done um, or were completed after school started. So that would have been end of August, beginning of September. Um, so just something, some context to the reasons, so, because this after everyone was enrolled in October. So these were the reasons that um, were, they were given as choices. Um, that you can see here on the screen, the most popular ones, um, as we mentioned, were not that the student necessarily has a medical condition, because we have some other programs for that, including home and hospital, but that the someone in the family had a medical situation which um, caused them to want their child to be in virtual learning, especially if their child was of an age in which they could not yet be vaccinated. Because if we remember back to the fall um, mm -hmm. and, and summer, that, that that was the case for our elementary age students. It looked but like another I, popular sorry. one was where it says 21%. Um, that looks popular where it says 
Yeah, it's that was the most crazy. popular. My child works better online. Now, whether that's actually true, we would be um, something we could discuss, you know, and look at the data, et cetera. But that is was the perception of the family was that their child actually works better online, um, presumably based on the experience that they had last spring um, during remote learning. OK, OK, yeah, that's what I was curious about expanding on that. But you're saying right now the data to expand why their child was working better online. We don't have that as of right now. Well, we did, what we didn't do is correlate the the families that answered with that response with how their their child is actually doing online to be able to quantify that what they perceive to be the case is actually the case. Got it. OK, and then uh, my other question was as far as um, remote learning, I wanted to kind of discuss or, or get feedback as far as um, I believe the numbers are going down now, but for people who parents who were concerned about their children um, and the numbers um, in relation to COVID. What is the likelihood of us having an option where parents can opt in or is that something that's even available? I know that there was a certain time to opt in, but um, hopefully the numbers will keep going down. But should they tick back up um, now? Parents have the ability to opt in to remote learning. What is the feasibility of that? During this school year? Yes, during this school year. Yeah, so what we found, what we thought might happen um, backing up to the fall is we thought what might happen was that when a vaccine became available for our younger students, um, that that enrollment especially would, would decline um, significantly or decrease significantly. That, that didn't happen. And qualitatively, we can tell you that um, students had relationships with their, their online teachers and with their administrators and were, um, we're, we're thriving in the online environment, which is why families chose to, even after their child was vaccinated, to stay in the online program. And, and because of that, our enrollment is still very uh, close to where it was in the beginning of the school year and um, continues to stay pr uh, pretty consistent. Um, there hasn't been enough of a, uh, a decrease in enrollment to warrant um, opening up additional seats for uh, enrollment at this time. In in-person enrollment, has it been a, a decrease enough in in-person or I guess a request to decrease in-person enrollment? You're saying to open up um, virtual. Right, I'm sorry, I, I didn't say it clearly. So there have, <laughs> the, the enrollment in the virtual learning program hasn't changed significantly to warrant opening up seats in the virtual learning program. OK, and then my last question is, is that um, I know that hopefully we won't have any more, but considering the weather, um, I just wanted to know um, if there had been like a formal request for ruling on a virtual school day um, approval or, or approving virtual school days um, in lieu of snow days. Um, there's probably someone better that can answer that question. However, what I do know is that currently MSDE has not approved uh, us to be able to do that is my understanding, but that there's some conversations in the works to um, explore that as a possibility. That is my understanding. And would that go to the state board? Right, my understanding and um, anybody who's on this call can correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is that MSDE has not come to a point where they would approve individual school districts to be virtual for an inclement weather day. But that so is, would that, that we're having not conversations something about specific that. to BCPS or would it be? I think that's a state um, decision, statewide decision. Uh, would we have to request that or? I'm not sure. I'm not sure if it would be. Um, you know, retroactive after we had the virtual day, if we re request it as a day or if it or it comes before that is that day happens. And I think that is the discussion that LEAs are currently having with the State Department to determine whether that's even going to be something we can request or implement in the future. Okay, is there anyone else on the call that, like you said, that could answer that or is that something I guess? No, okay. Ms. Scott. Yes. Hi, um, so just Mr. Handy. Um, uh, no, I cannot answer um, the question per se. However, I, I will uh, follow up as Dr. Elmendorf mentioned. Um, there could be some folks um, or staff who could answer that. So I'll, I'll just take that as an item to follow up on and make sure I get back to you and other committee members. OK, thank you. Um, it looks like we have two questions from Dr. Hager. Sorry, I'm having trouble with my computer. I'm in, in my office downtown. Um, thank you for the presentation. Uh, this is really great. Um, I ended up adding a few additional questions, <laughs> really easy ones though. Um, 
so I, I don't recall you saying this, but how many LEAs in Maryland are doing a virtual learning program this year? I think at one point, and maybe still currently, um, all of the school systems has some type of virtual component. And then some of them had, in our discussions with different LEAs, have um, modified their um, programs to respond to the different metrics. But I believe that every school system with the, um, I think perhaps Carroll County didn't have enough interest to um, run a virtual program, but I think most or all of the other systems had some type of virtual program. They each had different criteria and enrollment numbers were varied greatly between and among districts or and systems as well. Yeah, I had actually, I would heard that the number did not offer anything and I was really surprised by that, um, but I, it could have been, you know, the wrong source of information. So, um, but I would be curious, you know, at, like you said, now as you move forward, how, how the other districts do and things like that. So I know, and, and uh, Ms. Forbes can talk to this more specifically because she came from Queen Anne's, but there is a consortium of schools, for example, in the, in the Eastern Shore area where they all kind of um, join together to be able to access some online learning. So it's not individual systems that have it, but they join together because of the size of those systems and, and access some online learning as a as a consortium. Oh, that's interesting. Thank you. Um, and and if a student was um, had some degree of st specific accommodations, they some students were not allowed to do the virtual learning program. Is that correct? The determination of whether a student could be in the virtual learning program as it relates to that was made by individual teams. So students with um, an IEP, for example, the IEP team would determine whether or not the student's um, needs could be met in the general education environment of the virtual learning program. OK, um, and, and I think you may have showed this at this board meeting the other day, but are the demographics of the students that are enrolled in VLP similar to that of the, the county as a whole? Ms. Forbes, you want to? I think you have that information better hand than I do. Yeah, if we could um, go back to the demographic slide, which I apologize, I don't have the number, um, the or the enrollment. Seven, around six or seven. Yes, I, slide six, I, thought that I was looking at your demographics, but I guess I didn't compare it to. Yeah, that. it's a, yeah, it's actually we have both. Um, we could go back one, one more, I believe. Uh, go back one. Yeah, there we go. I see. I see, I see. Um, yeah, and so this one captures. And there are some differences between the overall VLP enrollment and the enrollment of the district. Um, and some of those are, let's see, I can actually bring up some of my, my notes again. So, um, and I can review that real quick. So uh, for example, the percentage of black and African-American students who are enrolled in VLP is nearly 58% compared to 39% uh, of enrollment in VCPS. The enrollment of Hispanic and Latino students in VLP is just over 8% compared to 12% of the BCPS enrollment. And the percentage of white students in VLP is slightly above 20% compared to 36% enrollment in BCPS. And then when we look um, at the student groups, the percentage of students who are English learners is just um, above 4% in VLP, while the district enrollment is eight. Um, special educate students who qualified for special education services is slightly different, um, about 11% in VLP, while the district enrollment was approximately 13%. And for these slides, I used the data from the, the most recent public data from the MSDE report card for the county, um, while the VLP data is um, pretty current, so. Okay, and, and have you looked at those categories of why kids chose VLP? And then if there were demographic differences within the reasons, thinking that we could use that data to address some of the root causes for why kids feel that they need virtual learning. Just thinking, I don't know. Well, we didn't ask, for student names when we did the survey to determine why folks wanted yeah. to be in the VLP. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that was an anonymous survey. Okay, of that, our families. That, that makes sense. And to that end, the social and emotional reasons that kids choose this, is there a home and hospital option for kids with social emotional concerns about being in person in school? So would that also kind of fall under the home and hospital? That's yeah, fine. so that's definitely separate. Um, home and Hospital is up and it has a virtual component right now and will likely have one for the foreseeable future. Um, so a student who qualifies for Home and Hospital, that, that could happen anytime during the school year. And, um, the, and with medical documentation from, you know, from a 
licensed psychologist or doctor that indicates that need. It's uh, evaluated by the Health Office of Health Services, much like the medical documentation for the virtual learning program, but that student could access home and health hospital um, through those services. And then that's um, typically a temporary um, measure it's for the to help the student get back to in-person learning whereas the virtual learning program is what we would consider a full-time virtual option um, we would hope that students would stay enrolled for the entire school year okay thank you and i'd love to see that lit review when you when that happens <laughs> I, I thought you might say that <laughs> <laughs> thank you thanks thank you for that next we have ms pastor thank you um, thanks again for this presentation. Very helpful. When will you do a follow up survey? This one was done early on. So when will you do one that will capture how um, parents and students are feeling about the experience uh, now that we're in the second semester? Right, and that's and exactly the, the plan is we um, wanted to do two. And so one at the beginning of the school year, one at the beginning of the second half of the school year, which is right about now. So perfect time to ask that question. OK, great. Um, along with that, I want to double back on uh, Dr. Hager's question um, in terms of looking at the enrollment breakdown and taking a look at the reasons for getting into the virtual program. Um, is there a way that you can cross them so that we do get some sort of understanding um, in terms of the demographics and the reasons how it all shakes out between those two groups? That's something I can certainly bring to the um, Department of Research and Accountability and Assessment to see um, what the, the best means of being able to do that would be. Of course, it would require us to, when we survey families, to ask what race um, they are and or um, ask the student name so that we could look it up ourselves. And I just have to you know, work with DRAA to determine what the best way to do that would be to make sure that we're respecting people's privacy and such. Absolutely. Yeah, even if it, it's by race, I think it would be helpful, not just for this program, but uh, just in terms of the system to have a sense of how people are feeling about um, why they go to school, why, how they feel successful, what are the barriers to their successes. I have to say, I don't think I've ever seen anything, whether it's face to face before the pandemic, since the pandemic, that really gives us a good indication um, in terms of the so social emotional about what turns children on and off to school and makes them successful. And this just looks like a, a good time to have a sense of that. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I would um, just to follow up on that, because I, I, I did have an additional question. Um, when I look at this chart, where it says BCPS enrollment, I'm on the that page. Uh, this, the number that's the most stark is um, where it's 39.40% African American or Black, but then 57.62% are opting to enroll in the VLP. And if I heard you correctly, you're saying that you don't have any data or any information as to why that is, because that seems to be the most the starkest contrast. Yes, so we did not ask our students what well, we asked the students why or we asked the families why they enrolled in the VLP, um, but it was an anonymous survey, so we did not um, when students enrolled back in June and in July and even in September. Um, they did not have to give us a reason as to why they were enrolling. I'm sorry, in September they did. They had to have medical documentation, but never did we ask them why they were enrolling, um, you know, when they were just enrolling back in, in the spring, which okay. is what most of these students are in the VLP as a result of enrolling, self-enrolling in the spring. And, yeah. and they were not asked what race they were or, you know, what demographics were associated with their family. Yeah, but you have the demographics so because I see that here where it says black, sure, African American, right. Asian, Hispanic, white. Um, but I guess what I'm looking at is I'm looking at where it says the West zone is 1,046 and then East. It looks like those are the two zones where you have the majority of uh, children in the West and the 
East Zone, where you have the majority of the children choosing to um, enroll virtually. And I guess mm -hmm. I would like to know why are they choosing to enroll virtually as opposed to coming into school? Um, I understand um, because I'm in the West Zone, so I've spoken to parents and I know that there's the fear or um, concern as far as COVID-19, fear of exposure, some of the things you talked about. Um, but what I want to make sure is that we are aware and looking at if there are any other concerns that, that may be out there or any other inequities that are making um, families choose to do um, VLP right. enrollment. So when we did ask families why they chose to enroll in the VLP, we did give them the option of uh, um, answering other. And so we have some qual and they had they could explain what the other reason was. Um, I do you know, I have some qualitative comments I can certainly share as a follow up to um, this committee meeting um, with you. But I can tell you that the qualitative comments in the other category were very much related to some of the the ones that they were from which they were able to choose, but they wanted to give some context as to why they gave that answer. Can you share some of that context? What was it? I, I can certainly share that as a follow up. I don't have the 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 results here in front of me right now, the qualitative results in front of me, but um, from from what I remember in October, looking at the, the qualitative data, um, people would be specific about why, you know, what is going on in their family with, um, medically or um, if they chose bullying and uh, harassment as their reason, they would give, they clicked other, um, and then they would give an explanation as to what type of bullying was happening in the schoolhouse that um, compelled them to choose that option of virtual. Oh, learning. I didn't see bullying. Okay, so that was a concern. I didn't know that. <laughs> that would be, yeah, that would be good to follow up on to know because I, I'm, I'm um, from looking at this and hearing, I'm assuming it's COVID related or someone, you know, yeah. the household that may be ill, but um, I, that's the purpose of this committee to make sure that we do a deep dive so that there, right. if there are other underlying issues or things like that, that we um, find out and, and we make ourselves aware of that. Right, so 7% so of the um, response were bullying, bullied, a uh, child was bullied or had a negative experience in school was one of the choices and there was a 7%. OK. Were there any others or was that the it was either COVID or bullying? Well, we can go back to that slide if you'd like. Um, I think it's slide around slide 12 ish. Um, after attendance. There we go. So they oh, had the, okay. those are the choices they had. Got it. OK. All right. Yep, yeah, thank you for that. Looks like Ms. Pastor has additional questions. Yeah, it goes with the same thing. Just piggybacking on um, what Ms. Scott just asked. I just think that understanding what the other, if you will, is, is very important, especially in terms, as she pointed out, to this committee, um, because I suspect that they are those who um, saw some level of respite in being able to do it virtually in terms of comfort or attention for their children. And this is just such a good opportunity to not only um, serve as a barometer for virtual, but to get some inside information about what are the barriers that our children have when they're in school. Because mm -hmm. in saying why they want to go to virtual, tells you a lot about what some of those barriers are in the schoolhouse. Right. So this won't be forever, but the schoolhouse will be. So um, yeah, that specificity about which Ms. Scott was just um, speaking and what I'm saying, and I, I think what Dr. Hager's questions had to do, really are going to give us some insight long beyond this about how we better uh, work with our children in school and what kinds of services they need in school. And we know that there's some often there's some misconceptions about who does the bullying mm -hmm. and and um, who the victims are. This will give us a good sense in light of your demographic, the demographics um, so that we can really get to some things as to um, 
those concerns. So let me ask you this then, um, considering what, you, what you're stating. Um, now that we're getting re ready to roll out yet another survey, um, clearly we're asking them why they enrolled in the BLP. Are you, are you asking them that we would have some type of um, demographic breakdown that is associated with the answers to that question? Are you, are you um, suggesting maybe we add additional questions? Do you have suggestions? My suggestion is, is mm -hmm. pretty yes. much both, much both um, that it becomes as much as possible, even more specific. If you say bullying, um, I mean, that really can have a wide berth. See, some right. children get bullied by staff on some, in some cases based on any number of things, um, or they have that sense of that. Um, um, so, yeah, just giving folks an opportunity to, to, to share what the areas look like. What does bullying look like? What does it mean when you say, um, what was the one I just, so anxiety, uh, mm -hmm. anxiety or social yeah. emotional. See, we keep saying social emotional, but really what does that mean? What does that mean to the children? What are the things that give them that anxiety to ask that question that's a new question what causes the anxiety for you as as a student parents flexibility for parent for family schedules activities um what exactly does that mean it doesn't mean i get to go to the as the parent this helps me to be able to go to the gym more frequently what does that mean because if we're going to have the parent vehicle or university or whatever it's specifically called it might be helpful to know some get some idea of what they mean so that we know what we're doing to support our parents okay thank you that's good information thank you yeah so like i said I'll, what i'll do is i'll meet with our um, research and accountability experts and come up with a, a more robust uh, survey especially in this area to, to determine um, some more specificity, specificity as to why students are, are seeking out a virtual option. I think that would be really useful. I mean, the things that Ms. Pastor said I think are spot on, and I think that this is a great time for us to be able to take a deeper dive right. and get some more um, information um, because if the child works better online, I'd like to know why <laughs> i mean you know so it works well for some but uh, but my assumption would be that you know it, it you work better in a classroom um and so what are the reasons for that um anxiety or social emotional um what brings that on is it because of the fear of getting covid or is it the fear of returning to school um and and also like was said you know my child was bullied or had negative experiences in school maybe expanding upon that um a bit uh just uh, who yeah, you, we, mm -hmm. Go ahead. One thing we might also do is um, because getting good answers, as we know, is dependent upon the respondents' willingness to elaborate yeah. on what, on their answer. So one thing that we could definitely consider doing, and we have done a little bit of this with different questions, is um, focus groups with our students. So choosing, you know, students from various grades and really getting digging deeper, like you said, to say, OK, well, you said you, you wanted to enroll. You told your parents you wanted to enroll in the virtual learning program because you were bullied. Can you tell me more about that and be specific as to why you thought virtual learning would be the, the answer for you and would help you to be more successful in school? So the a focus group might get to some of those things that we're really looking for. And it looks like Dr. Hager said focus groups. Um, uh, but what about uh, do we do focus groups with parents or is it just specifically with students? We, we could definitely do it with both. OK, I think mm -hmm. that would be a great idea. And then um, I'm not sure how how long something like this would take, but I think that would be great. And and then maybe bring the results back and present it okay. um, at our next equity committee meeting. If not this one, then the one after okay. I, I think would, would, would be really good because this kind of like gives us a surface level idea of, of what's going on. Um, mm -hmm. But I think um, having a, a more um, robust um like you said survey focus groups so we can get down to the um sort of get below a, a little bit and then also hearing as far as what you were um what mr handy said he was going to check on as far as um the virtual snow days and, and things like that i think will be will be useful 
Excellent, thank you. Yep, thank you. And I didn't want to monopolize. Were there any other questions or comments from board members? No. Okay. All right, so that's um, pretty much what we had. I wanted to make sure that we had an uh, opportunity to discuss this and really go over it. And I'm, I'm glad for the time that we have to really take a deep dive. Um, so um, next would be any sort of discussion for what we would like to see um, on our at our next meeting anything that anyone um, would would like to discuss. Um, I've already brought up um, the results. Do you have an idea of how long the next survey will take about? I think we could definitely aim for the, not the next one, but the one after would probably okay. be best so that we can even if we had the surveys and especially if we're going to do focus groups, obviously we have to set those up and get permission from parents to, to you do focus group with students and stuff. So um, in order to co collate the data in a meaningful way like it is today, we I think two from two meetings from now would probably be best. Two meetings from now. OK. All right, Mr. Hean, do you have all that? Yes, yes. ma'am. Yes, ma'am, Ms. Scott, I, I do. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. OK, perfect. Um, and then I wanted to open the floor to members to see if there's any further business that you would like to see on the next meeting or two. Um, to discuss to have it included here. I'm just checking the chat, make sure I didn't miss anything. No? OK, great. All right then. Looks like we are ending on time. So this was a great presentation. Oh, yes, Mr. Handy. Yeah, OK, thank you. So Dr. Hager, I, I saw she was typing. Right, just want to mention as far as our next meeting, so for February, we do have the presentation that Mr. Thomas had requested around our uh, support for our LGBTQ uh, plus student population. Uh, so we have staff working on that for February. We also had a request for the uh, CTE program location. And uh, really judging by, and I really appreciate the, the rich discussion we've had this afternoon. So. I'm thinking about maybe having the LGBTQ plus scheduled for our February meeting okay. and then perhaps when Dr. Elmendorf um, returns with his team uh, for March to follow up on discussion, that might be a good time to include the CTE, but I'll make sure we plan it out just to give enough time for the discussion, but just wanted to, um, you know, recount what we have for our next two meetings so far based on um, committee input. Got it. Miss Scott and yes. Mr. Handy, will that February presentation include um, some demographic information for them as well in terms of how many are doing virtual, why some of the same things we got here, but more specific um, to the LGBTQT plus? Or, or does that not register? I, I would like if we're looking at that presentation to have a sense of whether how many chose to go virtually as well and if there were any mitigating circumstances to that end or am I taking this somewhere that Christian didn't want it since I didn't hear his question. Sure, Ms. Pastor. So um, I, I see where you're going. I think that would be useful information. Uh, my concern in having that information for you all next month is that that's not an identifier that we typically collect from students, right? So they would have to self, you know, just like what Dr. Elmendorf talked about in focus group surveys, we would, we could certainly con um, create that mechanism. I think we might do something similar to what we've done this afternoon, perhaps have that base presentation for you all and then like your request and any other requests that come out of the committee, we could do some follow up. But I, I think it's going to take some of you know what uh, Dr. Elmendorf just shared um, and Ms. Forbes. We're going to have to probably do some, you know, some focus groups, some surveys. Oh, you're know. right. You're right. You're right. Forget forget that. Yes, yes, right. yes, yes. Because that was not that was not in the initial um, concern in terms of going to that. So maybe when we do the broader one. Um, as you look, as we were talking about, um, Dr. Hager and Ms. Scott and I were talking about what are the reasons, if that crops up, 
mm -hmm. in the one for March or April, whenever that comes up, that'll be fine. So dis disregard that. Yes, right, because that would not have been a part of the initial questioning to come into that. So you don't have any frame of reference. Disregard, but it might come up as one of the reasons under social emotional when we're doing the larger survey, the next survey, et cetera. That's fine. I'm good. Thank you both. You're welcome. That makes sense. It may come up under mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Good point. Um, I have a I have a question kind of related to the conversation for next month. We don't collect LGDP, LGBTQ plus data at the student level, correct? That's only from the YRBS data as a system. Is that anyone? Correct. <laughs> I'm sorry, Doctor. So you said, Doctor Hager, what was correct? But what was the, you said though? From what system do we collect it? I'm sorry. Um, well, the county or the state health department, when they do their risk, youth risk behavior surveillance okay. study, they um, and the CDC, it's a question on there. So what we can look at trends and prevalences as a school system, but not at an individual school or student level. I just wanted to make sure that was accurate. Yes, yes, you're correct. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. That's the same question, uh, Dr. Higgins, that you put in the chat. Yes. Okay. All right. Okay, I got you. Thank you. Got it. Okay, so that will be presented at the next meeting or the meeting after. Um, Christians. Um, that that uh, would be our next our next meeting. The February our next meeting. meeting. Yes. Okay. Great. Perfect. All right. Were there any other questions, or did anyone else have any other suggestions for our next meeting? I'm looking forward actually to the survey and um yeah. and and to the feedback i i'll be very um curious to hear that great okay is there any further business okay so since there's no further business then our meeting is now adjourned and i thank everyone very much for their time great thank you yeah thank, thank you, you. Thank bye bye, you. bye.